and held up to the sun. However, the only point of departure from the practice of old is the fact that whereas the bodies of victims would be thrown down the stairs of that monster pyramid, today the bodies are set on fire as burnt offering to Satan. This burning of the victims' bodies are often done while they still lie on the altar of sacrifice. In as much as this act is today proscribed by the authorities in Mexico, it still exists as a major spiritual expediency. Across Mexico, there are other ways in which humans are still being sacrificed in a ritual to the devil. Nonetheless, across the communities that still practice this despicable ritual of human sacrifice, the object and driving force in that society still remains the fact that this people must be offered as food to their gods. Repentance It is most disturbing to learn that this cruel and evil ritual of human sacrifice did not only involve adult victims, but also saw children being sacrificed to Satan. It is an event that pathetically always attracted multitudes of people from all walks of life in the Mexican society. However, when the fullness of time came for the Lord God Almighty to prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah, he began to demand responsibility over man's actions. That is the reason the Lord sent me to Cholula, in order to proclaim the massive national repentance from sins and especially that of human sacrifice. It is as though God's requirements over man's conduct took a definitive quantum leap, as he reproves the land. Acts 17 verse 30 to 31 says, In the past God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. By every word that proceeded out of his mouth, the Lord eventually led me into the Cholula community in Mexico. While there, Jehovah decreed the need for the Cholula community to repent and turn away from the wickedness that had pervaded every structure of their lifestyle. Among the wicked acts that the people in Cholula had engaged in, was the heinous practice of raw witchcraft for purposes of bewitching and even ruining people's life fun to death. Witchcraft in Cholula developed to the extent that every other household required some evil spirits in order to sustain their existential needs. When people fell sick, witches were consulted and witchcraft was practiced. The profanity of it all was well evidenced in the fact that ultimately witchcraft failed to not only offer a solution to their livelihood, but also offered any improvement to their lifestyle whatsoever. As goes the saying, birds of the same feathers flock together. So it was in Cholula when the practice of witchcraft indeed exacerbated the dispiriting form of sexual immorality. What particularly stood out during that Cholula mission is that the Lord demanded a total clean-up of witchcraft from their homes. Accompanied by my host pastor, I then began a mighty clean-up program called Limpia de Casa, which in Spanish means clean up your homes. It is a program that saw hundreds of households bring out their witchcraft paraphernalia and surrender them at one central location. I then set the concoction of witchcraft on fire in an event that should have marked the onset of a total Cholula cleanup. Had God gotten a committed partner in Mexico? Oaxaca State in Mexico equally suffered the horrendous wounds of witchcraft and sexual immorality. Kayapos too wasn't left behind in the quest to anchor witchcraft as a source of man's livelihood and protection and the list goes on and on. This narrative of the state of the affair in Mexico can only help to emphasize on the reason as to why a bitter road developed between that land and Jehovah God. While trotting across the entire Mexico, one phrase for sure never departed my lips, repent Mexico, and prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah. While making this pronouncement, 
The Spirit of the Lord did not fall short of perpetually reminding me to assert to Mexico that a failure to repent would indeed attract the wrathful sword of God. That became the prophecy of the bloodshed that was to come on Mexico. The tragedy of rejecting repentance then became Mexico's calamity and undoing that the nation's so reproach to date on her countenance. And the sharp sword of God Almighty indeed butchered the land of Mexico. Blood has since then soaked the soil of Mexico as the majority of people flee to other nations across the earth. The situation in Mexico has since then gotten so bad that the authorities are in the state of near defeat. As were my uttered words in that meeting at the Pueblo Gymnasium, so was it when all hell broke loose in Mexico. I had earnestly promised Mexico that when this prophecy of the sword of God would come to pass, and begin to butcher the land, then they would for sure know that the prophet of the Lord had walked among them. And today, Mexico knows it too well that the prophet of the Lord, indeed walked that land. In the hope of arriving at an awakened church, God Almighty in heaven despatched to the earth a deputation of horsemen that would stir up the bases of humanity's lifestyle, and cause them to rethink their course. Since this delegation of well-prophesied first, second and third apocalyptic horsemen approach the earth, they have indeed shaken the life of mankind to the core. In doing so, these first three horsemen of the apocalypse, namely white the first horseman red the second horseman and black the third horseman express an air of profound authority that was not designed to impress mankind but to command the difference between God's requirements and man's haughtiness. Yet their preaching to the inhabitants of the earth has now become the direct biblical announcement of the coming Messiah. It was in this very context that on July 29, 2009, while at the airport in Johannesburg in South Africa, the Lord of Hosts spoke with me regarding the coming of the pale horse. It was on that day. As I awaited the transatlantic connecting flight, that I fell asleep on the airport floor and within the milieu of its busyness, I saw the vision of the Lord concerning the rider of the pale horse. In that tremendous vision, the voice of the Lord spoke from heaven saying, Look and see who is coming. Already shaken by the enormity of the voice of the Lord in that vision. In a great panic I immediately turned left and saw a humongous, gigantic horse that was coming with such a ferocious wrath towards the earth. The impunity of his advent was very obvious as it was well demonstrated in the most revered rage of his pacing. Firstly, it was his sheer size that stunned me beyond description in that vision. And secondly, it was the cruelty of his mean appearance and demeanor that struck me speechless, with a deathly awe. At this point in the vision, I was already beginning to well perceive that indeed this is the fiercest of the four horsemen. Within that vision, it was already becoming a very serious issue on how to maintain my composure, and yet still be able to tap on this most crucial message the Lord was conveying to the earth. It was in that neck of time that finally the Lord drew the pale horse with his rider very close to me. With the movement of respect and almost of fear, I stood on his way causing him to come to a complete stop right in front of me. Radiant Face The magnitude of this gravity though did not dawn until that very moment when the Lord of Hosts commanded me to touch his face the pale horse. In placing my hand on his face I noticed two major features that conspicuously stood out. Primarily, he, the pale horse, and his rider, presented like the great ancestral men, in their retrogues, in the pride of their ranks and the powers of their reign, as then they stood to provoke the awe that they indeed held. Moreover, it would have been more difficult to lose sight of the great radiance of the glory that was about his face. 
This fourth horseman of the apocalypse sported splendid patches of brilliant glory that directly radiated from his vicious face onto his surrounding domain. It was with such command that he without a doubt took charge of the area of his jurisdiction. In that monumental vision, as I continued to touch his overbearing and totally domineering face, it was then that realized that the glorious patches on his face were as a matter of fact in round clusters that totally engrossed and lit up the fury of his visage. Still totally caught up in this grand standing and impediment with this horseman in the vision. I then began to clearly see his eyes lighting through that overpowering glory of his face. It was the scrutiny of the keenness with which I noticed that he eyed me. That caused me to now perceive the enormity of his sending. The super courageousness that this pale horse exuberantly exuded was greatly enhanced by the adorning glory that consequently lit up the straight long hair of his cheeks. In this vision, I then realized that this is when heaven indeed bore witness to his discharge. His long mane. In what clearly displayed the hardened and darkened heart. The rider of the pale horse in this mighty prophetic vision orchestrated his horse to display a unique feature that is out of this planet concerning horses as we know them. This fourth horseman of the apocalypse caused his horse to display its long outstretched mane right in front of me. The act of stretching this long unique mane appears to have been a great demonstration of his supernatural might and power. It equally relayed a message of his accumulated thrust that would eventually have to be unleashed upon his flash release, one day. The main I saw in this stunning vision was assuredly and extremely glorious, therefore forming a very distinctive feature of this apocalyptic horse. What particularly became most baffling is the accordion role that the main seemed to play in synchrony with the discharge of this horseman's appointed duties. The long mane at the pale horse spotted unmistakably articulately underscores the thriftiness and swiftness with which he is meant to operate, both in the physical and spiritual realm. In his appointed role, this angel of death appears to have been delegated with speed and precision, both of which functions the main reserves key role. In this vision. I could not help but notice the duo-functional role that the main critically plays. It emerged very clearly that in the most threshold moments right before dispatch, the pale horse would charge up his main causing him to accumulate both a mechanical advantage and momentum with which to thrust out at a supernatural pace. This I witnessed as the main became very crucial in generating a muscular strength and push by working the air around the horse in order to create a positive pressure that catapulted his velocity. In the spiritual realm, this implies that his awful effects of death upon the earth is supposed to be achievable in the shortest possible time. Secondly, in that perplexing July vision, it became vividly clear that the outstretched mane essentially derived its structural support from the gigantic shouldered muscles of this enormous apocalyptic pale horse. In that way, the mane also functionally denoted the wings of this shocking horse of the end time. I could then easily envisage how at high velocities this mane practically can help the horseman to fly over rivers and get to its target territory. The spiritual message therefrom becomes the added supernatural ability with which this fierce horseman can gain more ground on the earth, and do greater exploits within a relatively very short time span. His furious rider. With the ears of the pale horse straightened and raised up, the spirit of the Lord then led me to pay particular attention to the rider of this ferocious heavenly beast. Suddenly, as the glance of this fourth horseman's eyes swept over me, his glare kindled an incredible form of evil that I had never been turned to, nor had ears even listened to. Such was the impunity with which he would come to encounter mankind, upon the fullness of his time. 
a severe prophetic utterance was at this time beholding. Of particular interest though were the sharpness of his eyes and the fact that they presented such an unmatched scrutiny that swept through like a searchlight. A total scan of his face was what would send agonizing chills down one spine. This look of terror owed its sting from the bizarre tear like bloody strips of markings that ran down his cheeks in a near vampire or ghostly presentation. While with these bizarre observations, one would easily run into a state of mere denial. But that the countenance of the rider of this pale horse had deeper meaning on death on coming, is an argument no one can ever easily gainsay. During the moments that followed, when the privilege availed in this vision, the Lord God then permitted me the grace with which to look slightly above his most dreadful eyes. It was at that very instant that I was hence able to observe the manner in which the rider of this apocalyptic horse had well covered, and fully draped himself with a shawl. The shawl with which the rider of this pale horse covered himself terminated at his forehead as it was held in position by two well-rolled strings of knit cloth. Each knitting was carefully consigned to ring around his head thereby exposing only the minimal area of his face. This in the vision, alluded to his desire to maintain a bizarre obscurity towards mankind. Probably, this attribute of this fourth horseman of revelation can be directly linked to the fact that he does not well relate with the realm of the living, being entirely confined to the agency of the dead. His name is Death and he takes away the living into the dominion of the dead hell. The shawl that this deadly fourth horseman adorned, appeared to have been deliberately designed in such a way that it was well tucked in between the two rings of light bundles. To the extent that this rider of the pale horse in earnest portrayed his great eager of readiness to encounter the earth's headwinds at takeoff. It is the length and breadth of this heavenly conversation with the Lord that spoke it all on the gravity of the pale horseman and his consequent coming. At this place in the vision, a moment came when the Lord intended that the rider of the pale horse enact the process of his release in a manner that would convey extreme urgency to this prophecy. Then the Spirit of the Lord swiftly lifted me back to the earth in a flash second, and I found myself standing. All this happened while I was still in that shocking vision of God Almighty. It was then that while still in this vision, I saw the writer of this pale horse of the Apocalypse, this time pacing his way towards the earth. As he swiftly galloped down the sky, this nasty fourth horseman moved with lightning speed to the extent that I, all of a sudden realized the prominence of his arrival on the earth. It was upon the cruelty of his advent on the earth, that I quickly noticed his overwhelming impact upon humanity, even as he galloped from one rooftop to another. At that time, I saw the fear and terror of his visitation grip the entire humanity. Considering his conscripted tomb-like countenance of some portions of his face in putrefied decay, it then indeed became an utmost stern event to behold. Church sided inside heaven. As all these spiritually hefty events unfolded right before the throne of God in heaven, a totally new scenario was again beginning to rapidly roll out. After witnessing the entire course of the actions of this deathly pale horseman, the Spirit of the Lord took me back into a heaven in this apocalyptic vision. This time around, I found myself again standing right before the mighty throne of God Almighty in heaven. It was then that the Lord graced my eyes further to witness the Church of Christ just at the instance of her entry into the Kingdom of God. They had just been raptured into the kingdom of God Almighty as the cloud of his glory lifted them off the surface of the earth, and closed the entrance into heaven. This presented an indescribable spectacular moment of all lifetime combined. Following this startling observation in heaven, 
I must say that the Saviour's presence was indeed on that day revealed through eternal peace, joy, comfort, courage and everlasting blessings. With awe and wonder I gazed upon that Church of Christ who had just been raptured into the Kingdom of God, with such adoration and sense of heavenly purpose. One awesome thing that clearly towered high in this end-time vision of the gathered saints, was that being taken up into heaven by the Lord had seen their countenance totally transfigured into the light of heaven. In their glamorous dressing and bearing, there was indeed nothing at all that betokened sin on that day. However, it became evident that this heavenly bride had just taken her rightful appanage in the kingdom of God. The most distinguished sight and melody then followed, and totally consumed the entire expanse of heaven, when those raptured saints began to effervently worship the Lamb of God and he that Saturday on the mighty throne. To say the least, the amount of joy that animated among the raptured church on that day, directly a portion to the gospel having successfully achieved its desired end by victoriously bringing down every mountain and hill, and exalting every valley of their hearts. Imaginations and every high thing that had earlier exalted itself above the wisdom of God's grace had indeed on that day been cast down with their every thought being brought into the directly captivity of solemn obedience to Christ. This state of affair was extensively happening among these heavenly saints. The Holy Church that I was privileged to observe at the wedding feast of the Lamb astoundingly exhibited an enormous glory upon their being and gowns. This caused the reading of the glory from the gowns of these precious saints, to unmistakably radiate the exuberance of holy flashes of light in all directions. Put together, sweet unparalleled worship of melody, continued to saturate the expanse of God's heaven. When I looked there, I saw that the Lamb of God was on that day being glorified by the minute. As that historic worship peaked, it developed into a high worship of historic adoration, with such an ambience of extreme joy that throbbed their hearts, in a true sign and wonder of this momentous age. Such a sign and wonder of joy unspeakable, consumed the saints in heaven, particularly owing to their eminent defeat of death. It was a process that had just been shortly realized over their lives, that rapture, one could not escape noticing the sense of accomplishment with which this glorious worship before the Lamb of God, healed the sighing of their hearts. In this vision, I further realized that as this beloved heavenly church continued to worship, it vividly emerged that they endear lifting up their holy hands, in a synchronized crescendo that befitted their feet. It greatly bespoke a unison of faithful purpose that highly registered in the heart of God. Moreover, with every occasion that this group had to worship the Lamb, they seemed to effortlessly sway from one direction to another, with their hearts permanently glued to the Lamb that is seated on the throne. It presented as though the long-awaited dispensation that which no further distraction would steal their hearts away from their Redeemer had finally dawned. However, with every sway, I saw their glorious gowns seem at marvelous flashes of light, as though myriads of lightning was abound. The nearest synthesis of this heavenly phenomenon into our physical realm could be just to the meager fraction equitable to thousands of camera flashes splashing in tandem at one go. It was such a blinding and glamorous happening that heaven beheld upon the church on that honorable day. In their heart of hearts, the true revelation of being created in the image and likeness of God Almighty in heaven, had on that day finally come for this precious saint's Genesis 1:26. It was hence at the tail end of this magnificent segment of that July 29, 2009 vision when I got awestruck at how two distinctively very different and opposite events could occur together in one vision. Upon waking up, I realized that I had been at the airport in Johannesburg, 
and that these two extremely antagonistic end-time events in one vision was very revealing. Prudence has it that the presentation of these two extremely antagonistic events in one vision directly points to their being very related in the timing of their occurrence. Verily, verily, on that day, God Almighty clearly presented unto mankind the choice between life and death, joy and suffering, worship and yelling, comfort and terror, and ultimately heaven and hell. The Horseman of Death Three Seals Prepare His Way Introduction Exodus 5 verse 2 And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. When the king of Egypt chose to engage in a bitter contestation with Moses regarding Israel's freedom, never did the slightest of thought wing his mind that Egypt would in her sunset days come to symbolize the end time wrath of God. And never was it ever envisaged of the horrific form that God's wrath would assume in the last days upon the face of this aging earth. In spite of possessing the highest technology then, ancient Egypt had to come face to face with the full-blown wrath of God owing to their profane secularism and idol worship. That Egypt was not spared the fullness of the fury of Jehovah, indeed goes a long way to underscore just how much heaven cannot tolerate the heathenism of man's heedlessness and lawlessness. Today we can, with certainty, say that when Jehovah struck the land of Egypt in those ancient of days, it certainly registered the catalogue of God's most revered fury. Courtesy of the August 19, 2008 vision of the discharge of the Black Horseman, the corresponding fulfillment of that prophecy on global economic meltdown, is what remarkably shook the Earth's core. Upon his release, this third horseman from heaven literally crashed the global financial order from west to east, and north to south. When the first spiritual horseman of the apocalypse prided himself as bent on conquest, it was very stunning to witness this third horseman do the actual conquering of the entire global financial systems. Black horseman prepares his way. It would eventually be the events trailing the 2008 release of the Black Horseman that would paint the true picture of God's bedtime wrath against sin. As the third seal was broken in heaven, the Black Horseman galloped from heaven across the ends of the earth, bringing in its way the historic dispensation of global financial crunch. This awful unfolding totally gripped the four ends of the earth with the fear of in the West to the extent that unemployment catapulted beyond the reach of fiscal planning. Austere measures and took center stage worldwide, causing such a dreadful sting whose contagion swept across the EU, including France, UK, and the US, among other developed economies. However, Greece and Italy today designate those nations that were not fortunate enough to escape the wrath of vengeance of this shrewd horseman, have succumbed. As the perils of the global financial downturn persisted on by deeply entrenching themselves into national budgets, credit lines were virtually rendered frozen. In this way, the third horseman of the apocalypse appeared to have had his way in demolishing man's economic defenses nation that clearly portrayed his field day. Undoubtedly, this is what thoroughly shook humanity from a state of complacency, comfort, and slumber. This awakening did not spare the church either. With such an economic meltdown raining its full force upon the major economies, all speculated that the Arab world with its enormous income dollars might escape this menacing peril. Nonetheless, it is the misgivings with which the Arab world maintained a suspicious tranquility at the height of such a historic economic turbulence that the global leaders to just how far their resentment would hold. 
Even so, when the real moment of reckoning manifested, the whole world was very stunned to realize that it had just been a matter of time before the harsh economic melancholy would weigh down on the Arab world. Hence, the initial attempts by the Arab economies to pronounce immunity was now quickly dissipating away, more like a lull before the storm. As the economic stability across North Africa began waning and dwindling away, all looked to how that things were headed south. Though no one could envisage the exact manner and form it would take, aware that he was coming in as the most immediate forerunner to the fourth horseman of death, the rider of the black horse of the apocalypse sustained relentless pressure upon these Arab economies, causing things to finally break loose. This was for all intent and purpose meant to demolish the backbone of those nations. To pay for the coming of the pale horse of death, the black horseman ensured that the structures which held those nations together were totally demolished. This rendered every household spiritually marked, so that when the angel of death came on his mission of death, he might unleash tragedy. What meaning then is attached to these protests? Such must have been the question during the people's minds as they watched and believed. The sudden turn that the global economic distress was taking in the Arab world. But because the nations did not see through the veil, nonetheless, it is the misgivings with which the Arab world maintained a suspicious tranquility at the height of such a historic economic turbulence that threw global interest onto just how far their resilience would hold. Even so, when the real moment of reckoning manifested, the whole world was very stunned to realize that it had just been a matter of time before the harsh economic melancholy would weigh down on the Arab world. Hence, the initial attempts by the Arab economies to pronounce immunity was now quickly dissipating away, more like a lull before the storm. As the economic stability across North Africa began waning and dwindling away, all knew it too well that things were headed south. Though no one could envisage the exact manner and for it would take, aware that he was coming in as the most immediate runner to the fourth horseman of death, the rider of the black horse of the apocalypse sustained relentless pressure upon these Arab economies causing things to finally break loose. This was for all intent and purpose meant to demolish the backbone of those nations. To pay way for the coming of the pale horse of death, the black horsemen ensured that the structures which held those nations together were totally demolished. This rendered every household spiritually marked, so that when the angel of death came on his mission of death, he might unleash tragedy. What meaning then, such a reformation as was now shaping, had not been witnessed in the land of Egypt at all. However, this did not come without a price. As a matter of fact, a heavy price was paid to the extent that live gunfire was the order of the day in Tahrir Square. The angel of death released Egypt. As the protests in Cairo gathered momentum, multitudes of relentless Egyptian youths and adults began flocking into the top ear square to vent their anger in their hymns. With crowds already charged up, things immediately turned more sour, causing a violent form of bloodshed to visit the streets of Cairo. This violence quickly picked up, rapidly transforming itself into a more hideous and ugly kind. When pro and anti warfare protesters appeared to engage each other using petrol bombs and lit gunfire day and night, it was at the height of such violence in Cairo that the Lord stunned the entire world in a manner never ever witnessed before. As petrol bombs were being hurled from all possible directions by pro warfare supporters, the unemployed despondent protesters equally stepped up their hop throwing in the top ear square. A heavy pressure had now mounted to the extent that massive blood spilling easily covered the streets of Cairo. As this bloodshed peaked, 
with dead bodies of victims littering the streets of Cairo, and the sound of gunfire rumbling across the skies. Surely the Lord God couldn't have found a better moment to capture the attention of the entire globe. In the fear of reliving the Tiananmen Square incident lived, almost the entire Earth was glued to their television screens watching the events as they unfolded in Egypt. People across the globe wondered whether a special red brigade would be unleashed on the top ear square to cause the most gruesome massacre of this age. Of sorts was the anxiety about it globally. As all viewers pay attentive scrutiny to the events rolling out of Egypt that night.